A particle of mass m kilograms lies on the top of a smooth sphere of radius 2 meters. The sphere is fixed on a horizontal table at P. The particle is slightly displaced and slides down the sphere. The particle leaves the sphere at point B and strikes the table at some point Q. We want to get the speed of the particle at the point B. Let's look at the forces acting on the particle at some intermediary position between its initial position and its final position at B. We have its weight vector mg which is pointing vertically down, its mass is m. And because the particle is in contact with this sphere, we have a contact force acting on the particle which is perpendicular to the surface of the sphere. Um, because this is perpendicular to the tangent line here, this vector is on a line that connects the particle to the centre of the circle. Because a line joining the centre of a circle to the point of contact of a tangent is perpendicular to the tangent, and the contact force vector by definition is perpendicular to the surface of contact of the objects. Let's call the magnitude of this. Now, these are the only two forces acting on the particle. Now, the reason that we know that is that we are given that one of the objects is smooth. Actually, the sphere is smooth. Now, let's suppose that both objects are rough. Let's see what would happen in that case. Okay, so this is supposed to be part of the sphere, and we have a rough particle sitting on the sphere. Now, the particle is sliding down the sphere due to gravity, so the particle will exert a force on the sphere in a direction that's tangential to the motion of the particle. So we could give this vector a name. This vector is the force on the sphere due to the particle. More accurately, it's the tangential force on the sphere due to the particle. Because the particle exerts a force on the sphere in a direction that's normal or perpendicular to the surface of contact. We are not interested in that force. So you can see where this force comes from. You know, if you look at this up close, the interface um, between the su surfaces, you will see what look like interlocking teeth. So, you know, the particle is, is moving down the sphere, so these th teeth are pushing on the sphere in the tangential direction. Now we can see the origin of the friction force on the particle. We just apply Newton's third law. So, if we have a force on the sphere due to the particle, we must have an equal and opposite force on the particle due to the sphere. So we could call this force FPS. So, by Newton's third law, FP, vector FPS is minus F vector FSP. So this is called the friction force. Okay, so we don't have to worry about this here because one of the surfaces is smooth. So that means that the, if we look at the interface, the surface of one object does not dig into the surface of the other object. Okay, so the sphere is smooth. So even if the particle was rough, we might see something like this close up. We see that we don't have any friction force on the particle of this vector r. Now let's look at the resultant force. Okay, here's a rough sketch of the resultant force vector. So we just sum these two vectors. Now, if this object was undergoing uniform circular motion, that means if its speed was constant as it moved along the circle, then the resultant force vector would point towards the center of the circle, as we've seen before it would be called a centripetal force. But that's obviously not happening here. Um, we're not dealing with uniform circular motion. We're dealing with non-uniform circular motion. And in the previous video, I explained that the resultant force vector um, will not point towards the center of the circle. But it will have a component along this radius line whose magnitude is the same as um, the magnitude of the resultant force vector if the particle was moving with constant speed on the circle. So if its speed was say v, if its 
uniform or constant speed was v, then the velocity vector would have magnitude v. Um, suppose at this instant its speed is v. Its speed is going to increase, of course, because it starts at zero, it starts from rest, and it picks up speed. But anyway, if it was constant and the speed was v, then the resultant force vector would have magnitude mv squared over r where r is the radius of the circle. In this case it's 2. Anyway, I explained all this in the previous video. Um, we are not interested in the actual resultant force vector. We are interested in its component along this radi radius line. It will point towards the center of the circle, this component, and its magnitude will be mv squared over r. Now we use the very important fact that if we resolve the resultant force vector along a particular line, in this case the ra this radius line, then that component is the sum of the components of the constituent forces along this same radius line. So the constituent forces that sum to F are R and Mg. Let's start with R. What's the component of vector r along this radius line? Well, vector r is entirely along this radius line by the geometry of the setup. Now, it's pointing away from the center, so we could give it a sign. Um, we could make it negative, actually, if it's pointing away from the center. Okay. Now, what about the component of the weight vector mg along this radius line? Well, we put project the tip of mg onto the radius line, at right angles of course, and uh, we draw in the component, which is this here. Well, we would have to multiply mg by the cos of this angle here. Let's call this angle alpha. We don't know what it is, but we'll just work with it. So we multiply mg by the cos of alpha to get the side adjacent to alpha in this right angle triangle. So we're going to make this vector positive because uh, this component is pointing towards the center of the circle, r is pointing away. Of course I could write this the other way around, mg cos alpha minus r. So here's the sum of the components of the constituent vectors along this radius line, and they must equal the component of the resultant force vector f along this radius line, that's pointing towards the center, and it's, magnet it's mv squared over r. You can put in the plus sign to emphasize that it's pointing towards the center. So r is equal to 2. Okay, so this equation describes the motion of the particle. Now, notice vector r. Well, notice the magnitude of vector r. That changes. Um, you see, when the, the particle is at the very top of the sphere, we can actually work out what r is. Because look at the forces acting on it when it's at rest at the top. Well, we have its weight vertically down, which is mg. And to counteract this force for equilibrium, we must have an equal and opposite force pointing upwards, also of magnitude mg. So r is equal to mg when the particle is sitting at the top. However, the particle rolls down the sphere, and as you can imagine, r must decrease because it's losing contact with the sphere. Well, it's always in contact with the sphere as it's rolling down, but there comes a point where r drops to zero. That's point B in the diagram. So the particle leaves the sphere at point B. So R drops to zero at this position. So now we can get an equation that describes the sphere at point B by setting R equal to zero. So we get mg cos alpha equals mv squared over 2. Where v is the speed at that point. In this case, we're get, you see the speed varies as well because the speed is increasing, of course. The particle starts at speed zero and increases in speed. So this is the speed at the instant that the particle leaves the sphere at point B. You can see that this equation doesn't depend on the mass. We can cancel m from both sides. And now we have an equation for the speed v. Now we don't know what alpha is, uh, so we don't have enough information, obviously, to calculate v. Now. What we can do here is use energy conservation to get more information that will enable us to calculate the speed. Why can we use energy conservation? Well, gravity is the only force on the particle that has a component in the direction of motion of the particle. 
Let's suppose that the particle is here. What's its direction of motion? Well, while it's in contact with the sphere, its direction of motion is tangential to the sphere. But the contact force on the particle due to the sphere is perpendicular to that um, velocity vector. No matter where the particle is, as long as it's in contact with the sphere, the contact force is perpendicular to the velocity vector. So the contact force has no component in the direction of the velocity vector. That means that the contact force does no work on the particle. Now the only other force acting on the particle is gravity. So, um, and that obviously does work in the particle because gravity has a component in the direction of motion. So we can apply conservation of energy. So we can say that the total energy of the particle when it starts up here is equal to the total energy of the particle when it leaves the sphere at point B. So let co let's call the initial position 1 and the final position 2. So by conservation of energy, the kinetic energy at position 1 plus the kinetic energy, sorry, plus the potential energy at position 1 is equal to the kinetic energy at 2 plus the potential energy at 2. Okay, what's the kinetic energy at 1? Well, the particle starts at rest, so it's a half m times the speed squared, where the speed is 0. Well, that's just going to be 0. What about the potential energy at position 1? Okay, that involves the height of the particle above some reference level. Now, a convenient reference level to use here is this one. We could, of course, use this line here, but there's no point, because we'd be adding on a 2, and uh, that 2 would just cancel from both sides, so we don't really need to do that. Um, so what's the height of the particle when it's in position 1 above this reference level? Well, it's just equal to the radius of the sphere, which is 2. So we multiply mg by the height, which is 2. Okay, that must equal the kinetic energy at this position. And uh, that's a half m times the speed squared, whatever v is. That's this v up here. So we can plug this in here later plus the potential energy at this position. So what's the height of the particle above this reference level here? Well, we can get that in terms of angle alpha. That's the angle that we're using here, so we want to keep using this angle, not in introduce any more unknowns. Um, all right, so how do we get that height? Well, we just do some simple trigonometry here. If we construct this right angle triangle, we know that the radius of the sphere is 2. We want the side adjacent to alpha in this right angle triangle. That's going to be the height of this above the reference line. So that's just 2 times cos alpha. So we have mg times the height, which is 2 cos alpha. Okay, now we can see that everything is independent of m, so it doesn't matter what the mass of the particle is. On the left-hand side we have 2g, on the right-hand side we have a half v squared plus 2g cos alpha. But 2g cos alpha is just v squared. So we have 2g equals a half v squared plus v squared, and we can solve now for v. So we have uh, 3 halves v squared equals 2g. v equals, we multiply by 2 thirds and, divide, and get the square root. So we get root 4g over 3 meters per second. Now in the next question, we want the speed of the particle on striking the table at some point q. Now this might seem like a very complicated question. Um, we found the speed of particle b when it leaves the sphere. It's going to be tangential to the sphere. That's going to be the direction of its velocity. We know that, that the magnitude of this velocity is root 4g over 3. So it looks like we have a fairly complicated question in um, projectile motion. So we could consider getting the height of the particle as a function of time and then setting the height equal to 0 to get the speed of the particle um, just before it strikes the ground. However, the only force acting on the particle when it leaves the sphere is gravity. So we can use energy conservation. This means that we don't have to worry about the direction of this velocity vector. We can just consider the speed of the particle, which is just a scalar quantity. It makes life much easier. OK, let's call this position 1, and the final position when the, just before the particle strikes the ground is 2. So we want the sum of the kinetic and potential energies when the particle is at position 1. So what's the kinetic energy? Well, it's half the mass times the speed squared. Well, here's the speed that we got from part 1. If we square this, we get 4g over 3. What's the potential energy? Well, that's mg times the height. So what's the height of this particle above the ground? Well, we already saw that this distance is 2 cos alpha. Now, the reference level will be the ground. 
okay it doesn't make sense to use our previous reference level because the particle passes through that reference level so let's get the height of it above the, the ground well that's 2 cos alpha plus 2 and this must equal the kinetic energy just before the particle strikes the ground um, let's call that speed v not to be confused with this v up here this v actually uh, refers to the value we got from part one this is the speed of the particle when it, it left the sphere at point b okay what's the potential energy when it hits the ground it's mg times the height well just before it hits the ground the height is zero okay so we can divide everything by m so again it doesn't matter what the mass of the particle is okay so notice here that we have g cos alpha well we don't know what cos alpha is not yet anyway but um our aim is to find v but that's where we go back to the result of part one we saw that the speed squared at the instant uh the particle leaves the sphere is 2g cos alpha so we need to square this quantity here so uh this is this is the v up here so if we square this we get 4g over 3 and that's equal to 2g cos alpha you can see that 2g cos alpha appears here so i can just plug 4g over 3 in for this so we get 2g over 3 plus 4g over 3 plus 2g i can write that as 6g over 3 get a common denominator of 3 so adding the numerators we get 12g over 3 which is 4g multiply both sides by 2 and take the square root we get v equals root 8g meters per second